night, everybody. My name is Brady Cox. I'm a professor at Utah State University. I'm a geotechnical engineer, and I'm excited to be giving one of the GeoPit talks today. The title of my talk is Earning Coin for Looking into the Dirt, uh, from Worm Picking to the White House. And the fun thing about the GeoPit talk is that I can talk about whatever I want, and it can be a little less professional maybe than some of the technical presentations uh, that we get. For example, talking about earning coin. The geotechnical engineering is, is a great way to earn coin. <laughs> and I'm excited to talk about that subject today. The first thing I wanted to start out discussing is a letter from Sid. Sid was a third grader at Elsa England Elementary School in Austin, Texas in 2014. When I was a professor at the University of Texas, I got to give a lecture in Sid's class. And it just so happened that my uh, second oldest daughter, Savannah, who's shown down here in the picture, was also in that class. But at the end of my lecture, the students wrote me some letters. And this is what Sid had to say. Dear Mr. Cox, thank you for your time. We were actually learning about earthquakes. The presentation was really good. You are really lucky you got to meet the president. Was it true or not? What are the things that can detect vibration called again? And my favorite line, like my third option of a job is an earthquake engineer. Well, I didn't really get to talk to Sid after this letter, even though I enjoyed it so much, but I would tell Sid that being an earthquake engineer was my third job option as well uh, when I was growing up. So how did I get from Helper, Utah to the White House? Uh, I grew up in Helper. A lot of you are probably going like, what's Helper, Utah? Well, Helper is a small coal mining community in central eastern Utah right here. And if you map it, it's about 2,082 miles if you were to drive from Helper, Utah to the White House. And this is a picture of Barack Obama, President Obama, and me uh, in, in the White House. And uh, I want to tell you about how I made that journey. And it, it wasn't really a quick journey by car. Uh, it took me quite a few years, actually. So my first job uh, as a coal miner's son was selling night crawlers. So yes, indeed, my father, this is him shown here, his name is Clayton Cox. He was a coal miner throughout my whole life growing up. And he worked in several different mines. And I would spend time with him on occasion underground in these coal mines. But my most prestigious uh, claim to fame is my prowess at picking worms. So from the time I was in about from sixth grade, let's say, until uh, I graduated from high school, I would go into the alfalfa fields at night where the farmers were irrigating uh, the alfalfa or hay for their animals. And I would pick night crawlers. I had a headlamp that I would wear on my head. And it was kind of like, almost like picking up dimes off of the ground because I would sell the worms or the night crawlers for a dollar a dozen. We had created this big sign made out of plywood that was in front of my house. And we used a Mr. Potato Head and some big hose that my dad got from the coal mine. And we made this hook. Uh, and this was like the sign that would attract people to come and pull into our yard to purchase night crawlers. So that was my first job. And I could make about, believe it or not, $2,000 to $2,500 in a summer selling worms. And I'll let you do the math on how many worms that is when you're selling them for a dollar per 12. But it was a lot. Uh, after high school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with myself. So I had attended a high school camp um, at Utah State University. It's, I think probably during the summer before my senior year and it was called engineering state and i didn't really have any other plans so i decided well engineering might be pretty cool so i attended utah state and i enrolled in engineering i started out in electrical engineering and ended up switching to civil engineering um, and that really worked out pretty well for me. I enjoyed the classes, but I was mostly just excited about graduating and, and going out there into the workforce. And then my senior year, I got involved with a professor doing some undergraduate research, and that changed the entire course of my life, I would say. Another thing happened that year. Um, there was a big earthquake in Turkey in 1999 that was called the Kojeli Turkey earthquake. And my uh, undergrad research professor at Utah State 
uh, Professor Jim Bay, he got some funding along with Professor Ken Stokey from the University of Texas to, to go to Turkey and study uh, soil liquefaction sites and strong motion stations that were affected by the Kojeli Turkey earthquake. And many of you have probably seen these pictures of these bearing capacity failures that were induced by uh, soil liquefaction beneath these four and five story structures in Turkey. And of course, there was also just complete devastation and some of the buildings that uh, suffered collapse during that earthquake. And some of you might recognize this person over here. This is Professor Aaron Budge. At the time, he was a PhD student. And in Turkey, they called Aaron the two meter man. And uh, the two meter man is shown here uh, dropping a 200 pound weight from a tripod. And we would put these geophones on the ground surface to record the seismic waves that were generated by this drop weight. And we would try and image the subsurface beneath uh, the receivers and attempt to recover the subsurface soil layering and the stiffness or the shear wave velocity of the different soil layers without needing to drill into the ground. So this was non-invasive subsurface imaging using a method called the SASW method or the spectral analysis of surface waves. When I was in Turkey, I had the opportunity to meet Professor Stokey and others. I met Professor Rafji, who was also a young faculty member at the time from the University of Texas. And uh, Professor Rafji, I think, was probably the first person that put it into my mind that I should consider doing a PhD. I had just started my master's degree, and I, I wasn't really interested in a PhD. In fact, writing a thesis was very scary to me. And, and yet as the year went on and I continued to process the data we collected in Turkey and I thought about the profound impact that that earthquake had on so many people's lives, I decided that I was interested enough in research and wanting to help uh, in geotechnical earthquake engineering that I would continue my education. So I went to the University of Texas, where I ended up working with Professor Stokey predominantly, and he opened up the world of subsurface imaging to me on a, a large scale. And we did projects all around the country at a lot of important critical facilities uh, like Oak Ridge National Lab and the DOE Hanford site, the Yucca Mountain Project. And we just did some really interesting work. And this wasn't really the topic of my dissertation. My dissertation was on soil liquefaction, but I spent a lot of time doing this subsurface imaging work. Now, when I graduated from the University of Texas, my first faculty job was at the University of Arkansas, the Arkansas Razorbacks. And when I was at the University of Arkansas, I had the opportunity to become pretty involved with GEAR. And at the time, GEAR stood for Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering Reconnaissance. And now it's a Geo Extreme Events Reconnaissance uh, because we don't just focus on earthquakes anymore. But I would frequently take my geophones and my non-invasive testing equipment on uh, earthquake reconnaissance missions with me to investigate the uh, the properties, the subsurface properties, um, where there had been different types of failures, uh, whether it was due to soil liquefaction or building collapses, in an attempt to retrieve the, the properties of the subsurface to use site response modeling or soil liquefaction triggering analyses. And when I was working on that uh, subsurface imaging research, I, I thought uh, at the time I was a young man and I was beginning a family and I was reflecting on, uh, you know, trips to the doctor where we had had ultrasounds, my wife and I, and uh, they would, the doctor would look inside uh, my wife's belly and inside there was a baby moving around and it's amazing uh, the advancements that have been made in medical imaging as we go from these two-dimensional grainy ultrasounds of the past for example to the ultrasounds of the present which are very lifelike and three-dimensional and as i said i went through this process four times uh, in my early life and these are my four daughters here and not once did they mess it up okay so they were pretty accurate uh, with these ultrasounds about determining whether I was going to have a boy or a girl. And I thought 
about geotechnical Im imaging and how we were really struggling even to do a good job of 1D subsurface imaging, whether it was from non-invasive surface wave testing or whether it was from CPT or SPT. But I thought in the future, we need a better way to retrieve subsurface images. And I wrote my NSF career proposal on that subject, and I was lucky enough to receive the NSF career proposal on revolution revolutionizing surface wave methods for engineering analyses. And my plan was to, to turn surface wave testing from deterministic and incoherent to probabilistic and standardized. And so that's how I ended up at the White House meeting with President Obama. I, uh, After I received the NSF Career Award, I received the, the Presidential Early Award for Scientists and Engineers. And uh, it was a pretty cool experience coming from Helper, Utah, a coal miner's son, to, and worm picking. At the time, in 2010, I wrote the following sentence. Traditionally, surface wave methods have been used to provide a single deterministic VS profile for each site tested without consideration given to uncertainty. An ever-increasing number of researchers and practitioners are using surface wave methods without understanding the uncertainty in their results. It's likely that no other non-standardized test is used in geotechnical engineering more widely than surface wave methods. And even though I wrote that in 2010, I think that holds true today. There's no other tests that are used more widely in geotechnical engineering than surface wave methods that don't have a an ASTM standard. And it's honestly a problem because without having standards, the state of the practice varies considerably from quite good to very poor. And one of the things I just want to stress is that you need to be very careful when you're having people do non-invasive subsurface imaging. And if they're not talking to you about uncertainty, then there's a problem in the results that you're, they're providing to you. But the future is bright. Um, as I moved on from the University of Arkansas, I went to the University of Texas. I, I joined back up with Professor Stokey um, on the Neary at U Texas Large Mobile Shakers facility, and I'm still a, a PI on that facility. And I don't have time to play this entire video, but I would just say that one of the things that we're working on is subsurface imaging in 2D and 3D. And there are some exciting challenges in the future. We've been doing work based on developing large three-dimensional subsurface models. For example, here's a three-dimensional model of the entirety of Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay um, using single station H over V measurements. And we've also been working on using, for example, fiber optic cables and full waveform inversion and machine learning to develop true two-dimensional subsurface images. So burn coin. Look into the ground. There's a lot of interesting challenges out there. I think subsurface imaging will just continue to play a larger and larger role in geotechnical engineering as we move forward. And I am grateful for the opportunity that I've had to, to work in this area so far in my career. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to give this GeoPit talk. And I hope that I said something that's valuable to someone out there. And uh, I leave that there and I just say, that's the end. Earn coin. Bye-bye.